What's up, Meta Nerds? Let's break down the Cantel class arrestor cruiser, something that we were teased with way back when the Han Solo movie came out. Now it's been really fleshed out, oddly being one of the new canon ships with a ton of info. From cost to armament, complement, crew, role, history, and behind the scenes facts. But first, I want to thank established titles for sponsoring this video and making me a true lord. My Isle's ancestors are surely looking on with pride, especially since established titles works as a fun way to preserve the natural woodlands of Edelston, Scotland, and restoration efforts all around the world, planting a tree with every order. How it works is that you purchase a title pack for at least one square foot of dedicated land, coming with a unique plot number, and works through a Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds, or lords and ladies in English, and so you can use your new title on credit cards, planting tickets, or throw it on your dating profile. You get this neat plaque, which even has your own crest, and it makes for a great last-minute gift, while keeping these wild areas from being industrialized, and helping global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees of the Future, which honestly is more than a lot of other lords and ladies can brag about. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot, so we can establish our own little Meta Nerds kingdom. And to make it even better, Established Titles is running a massive Black Friday sale right now, and if you use code METANERDS, you get another 10% off on top of that. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash METANERDS to get your gifts now and help support the channel. In 19 BBY, the Clone Wars was coming to an abrupt end, and from then on out, the propaganda machines went to work, playing a delicate balance between showing how great their leader was at ensuring peace, and that the rebels were so dangerous and powerful that the military branches needed endless budgets, often run through black books, away from oversight from the Imperial Senate. This is how massive projects like the Death Star were funded, but a rather practical ask by the Department of Imperial Justice and the Imperial Navy was for credits to be allocated for a warship specialized in capture operations. This would prove useful from the police force at your local spaceport, all the way up to moths who wanted to be able to capture rebel suspects alive, providing them valuable intel, and could work as a nice public spectacle as these enemies of the Empire were paraded across the media. Three years after this request was put in, Kuat Drive Yards started pumping out the Cantwell-class arrestor cruiser. This specialized craft would cost 2.2 million credits, making it a pretty good deal, about half the Arquidans, and likely around the same size with this cruiser designation, so I'd put it around 400 meters, or a quarter mile long, putting it in between the Arquidans and Dreadnought-class heavy cruiser. Unlike nearly every other Kuat creation, the pointed bow is flipped, now tapering off to the aft, where there are three of the same Dyne 577 radial atomizer engines like we see in the Arquidans. The bridge design and layout are similar to most other Imperial capital ships, but with a much greater array of antenna and comm equipment relative to its size, while being designed around these three massive tractor beam emitters. It also had three turret-mounted twin heavy ion cannons, 12 light laser cannons, and a complement of 24 starfighters, a 12 TIE squad in each of these hangars on the port and starboard sides which would also house at least one Thai boarding craft and various shuttles, landing craft, and utility vehicles, likely for setting down on ports, following a ship down to the surface, or searching through debris. A Thai boarding craft looks a lot like a Thai bomber, and some commanders did give up this Tie fighter space for bombers or Thai brutes, depending on the kind of enemy they expected to run into. That boarding craft would carry 20 stormtroopers, specialized in breaching and close quarters combat, like a space SWAT team raiding ships, which is really something I hope we can see in a gritty, rebel-centered series like Andor. Like most Imperial ships, we get that insanely overpacked crew at 2,770, which includes everyone from commander to mechanics, chefs, and pilots, but it was also said to carry 144 troops, and could move up to 4,050 passengers, though I doubt that was ever used, more a stat meant to represent the interior square footage, just in case for some reason you had to pack on a ton of people, like some sort of emergency evacuation. But the best way to understand it is to break down everything that happened in this scene. And the first thing I have to mention is that especially at this time, 14 years into Imperial reign without major unified rebel activity, the threats were all seen as just a bunch of disparate local annoyances, to the point that the ISB is debating if any of this is connected, or just local opportunists and criminals. And it's still three years before the official founding of the Rebel Alliance, and five years before the Battle of Yavin. So if you're wondering why some of the ship's features aren't utilized, I would cite the Rebels' greatest weapon, Imperial Complacency and Arrogance. The commander of the Cantwell felt that there was no way Luther's little hauler could resist them in any way. This is an Imperial patrol. So this ship is not just being relegated to ports or major hyperspace lanes, but is used to patrol star systems without any seeming complement or large fleet nearby, meaning they sensed that they could easily handle anything they might come across. And every ship they spotted would be put through a routine scan. 
Stand by for transponder scan. This actually comes right after messing with its comms and is likely due to at least the tractor beams themselves and the enormous energy that was being directed at the ship. But I suspect that that great sensor array on the bridge was there to cut off all outgoing communications. That way the target couldn't warn any other rebels or criminals, while opening up a single channel of communication directly to the arrestor, and using that beam to keep it exactly where you want it, putting the officer in complete control of the situation. The transponder that is being scanned is like a combo of a license plate and VIN number on a car. Earlier we saw Endor messing with the ID of a ship, which at a cursory scan just had to match the type of ship, like putting a legit tag from a white Honda Civic onto a stolen white Honda Civic. If you just run the tag, there's nothing alarming. Well, if you really got into the transponder data, you would find all kinds of stuff on the history of the vessel, just like a VIN number, and in starships it's showing the owners, ports you visited, hyperspace coordinates used, all kinds of stuff like that which might also be in the Nava computer. And that's why it's harder to manipulate, but not impossible. Like how we saw Cad Bane erasing data during the Clone Wars. Looks like Bane erased his navigation records, but... Not his fuel computer. The terms used and exactly how this works across different media isn't always the same, but what Luther's AI is doing here is like removing a VIN and engraving a new one that is matched to the same type of registered vehicle. Just like how you'd have two cars that seem legit and would only be detected if somehow they were both run at the same time. In the galaxy far, far away, they had to fake this digitally. I need an active transponder ID. Preference all drawn. In our older video breaking down how the Empire was implementing a sort of blockchain, a way to record the movement of everything, from currency, people, and even items, especially ships, this does show the weakness of applying that to physical items. Just because the digital ledger cannot be modified or hacked, Luther's AI is doing the same thing as looking for a real license or real VIN number for a similar hauler craft. Alderaan 129-12505 probably matches up to a clean craft legally registered, and so the blockchain technology only makes it so that some rebel sympathizer at the Imperial DMV office cannot just go into the computer and change things after the fact, or secretly print off new IDs. Everything's recorded on the blockchain, but they can leak out the lists of existing legal craft, and the rebels can just try and impersonate those. Also, another really cool detail is that the use of Alderaan registration is partially why the planet was destroyed. Not putting all the blame here on Luther, that goes to the Organa family for sure. But for the entirety of the Imperial era, all the higher-ups and intelligence branches, up to Vader and the Emperor, knew that Alderaan was the most powerful entity helping out the rebel groups. So many leads led here that Vader once locked the planet down to investigate. But since it was one of the greatest legacy worlds of the Republic, with tons of attention, credits, and connections, the Empire couldn't just push them around like some unheard of Outer Rim world. The Organas ran charities to fuel rebel groups, like we see Mon Mothma doing, and they just had the worst luck of ships and weapons being stolen from their planetary defense forces, while the Organas themselves were the most vocal opposition to Imperial authority. So it's just a nice touch here that he's calling for an Alderaan ID. And even if that tag did match, when the tractor beams engaged, he knew he was in for a more thorough search, and that it would likely reveal his rebel connection. Tractor beam has been engaged, Holcraft. Please power down your stabilizers. Sorry, Patrol. I'm a one-man show here. I have to manual these stabilizers. It's a nice look at the physics here and Luther's genius. While the imp is suspicious, it is believable that the autocraft's thruster is simply trying to counter what an autopilot computer would read as a dangerous gravitational pull. And so the thermal scan showing that a single engine was firing, and Luther saying that he's a one-man crew and has to figure out how to override this autopilot feature manually, is really believable and buys him some crucial seconds to prep his weapons. We also see thorough Imperial protocol, in that they were about to fire a tracking beacon. Like seen used with the Inquisitor's TIE Fighter, it would be able to broadcast a ship's location from almost anywhere in the galaxy. That way you wouldn't lose them even if they jump to hyperspace. Please disengage any propulsion units and prepare for tractor beacon. The ID does go through, matching some craft. Get a boarding team ready. Prepped and ready, sir. ID confirmed, sir. Alderaan Trade Alliance. Cancel the boarding? No. We can use the practice. But the tractor goes from a level 1 up to a 2, and then when the thrusters go full force, this stealth luxury ship is powerful enough to get the cruiser to jolt forward. And panic sets in on the bridge as the beams are put to their full level 5 force. You can think of the arrestor as playing a similar role to the interdictor, just at a smaller scale. As tractor beams do work by altering space-time itself to create a gravitational field, but the sheer scale of the interdictor with its four gravity well projectors creates what's called an interdiction field, which would prevent a ship from jumping to hyperspace since the computer would think you were still in a planet's gravitational pull. 
The tractor beam operators are considered a specialized gunner, with this being a lot more complicated than just pointing and shooting. You had to calculate the beam and direction in order to counter the resistance from the enemy craft. And it could be used to manipulate the craft to bring it exactly where you wanted it, keeping them far away and letting your fighters and boarding team deal with it, or lining it up for the perfect ion cannon shot, or bring it into ports or a larger fleet, where you could pass off the craft into the tractor beams of a space station or ISD. The ISD's tractor was used to capture Princess Leia, and for reference, the Death Star had 768 tractor beams, which made it easy to capture the Millennium Falcon even at such a great distance. Does he think he can get away? Hinting at that overconfidence I mentioned, and when Luther's unique flechette-style weapon is unleashed, the projectiles rip through the main tractor beam projector, and when the raiding party is launched, we see a sparse complement. The hangar could accommodate the full 24 ties, but is only running with three fighters and one boarding craft. The bulky TIE BR is easily blown away. While the automated turret whips around and one-shots the fighter, Luther buzzes the cockpit, which is full of paralyzed imps, who are certain that a pair of these feared TIE fighters is surely enough for a janky pirate hauler. And neither the laser cannons or ion cannons are ever fired. To be fair, the heavy ion cannons would have almost zero chance of hitting a smaller craft like this while it's zipping around. But even the light laser cannon gunners are either in shock or just waiting for orders, or the weapon systems weren't even ready, as the commander talks about boarding just for practice. And since they have such a sparse complement, they surely are not used to combat. Even though he said it was a pirate zone, this could just be a blanket claim used by authorities to conduct searches. I know this sounds funny and I could see why you might disagree, but I think it's just pure luck that this was near the planet Saw Gerrera was hiding out on. Saw was the most wanted criminal in the galaxy at this point, had already conducted raids so violent that other rebel cells were avoiding him, and some even called him a terrorist. And Luther didn't expect to run into any imps out here, and so everything points to this being an untested Imperial unit in the middle of nowhere. And with the use of his beam weapons to destroy the final TIE fighters, the Cantwell commander is left to stare at his failure. Like those TIEs, his career had just gone up in smoke, and he would be demoted and sent off to some even more remote and obscure sector of the galaxy. Ironically, this Captain Elk might still be in charge of a Cantwell class, just at one of the Imperial shipyards or construction zones, deprived of any chance at glory in combat, simply using the tractor technology to keep traffic lanes in order and ensure that materials were safely transferred, as Intel confirms that arresters were used for this very mundane purpose as well. In the last video, The Dauntless, I mentioned how it was devoid of my favorite feature, the tractor beams. So I thought it was awesome to see this thing in action on screen, especially since it was shown in the concept art from the solo film. And there was a whole scene written where the Falcon was going to be captured by one, but this ended up being cut, and all we got is this brief appearance in an Imperial recruitment film. But in the novel adaptations of the movie, we get the story of Han Solo at the Karida Academy, being a member of Onyx Squadron that flew Thai Brutes, and were assigned to an arrestor cruiser. When they came across the path of pirates flying the incredibly agile Z-95 headhunters, the brutes were no match. Solo's ship was damaged and he had to make a crash landing into the arrestor's hangar, where he would take out two friendly ties as well. This got him sentenced to a tribunal, and demoted down to an Imperial Army grunt, and shipped off to one of the worst battlefronts in the galaxy, the Mudfields of Mimban. This ship has one of the most interesting backstories and importance in Star Wars ship lore. This was the original design for the Imperial Star Destroyer, then called the Sith Cruiser. These triangular ships were to be the Empire's main starfighter before the TIE Fighter was created. Colin Cantwell worked with Lucas and Ralph McQuarrie to create everything from the X-Wing to the Death Star. It was called the Sith Carrier because even by the fourth version of the script, the enemy was called the Sith, not the Empire. And sketches and later concept art show that these dishes were more like big death ray beams. But once it got this tractor beam role, it was named the Arrestor, but also the Cantwell class in homage to its creator and 40 plus year old design. Now most of the stats come from this book, Starships and Speeders, which is a must have for anyone interested in these kinds of videos. And if this matters to you, it is new canon, as it came out in 2020, but is packed with all kinds of amazing craft that you normally only see in Legends Guides. If you want to pick it up, there is an affiliate link down below. But the best way to help me out is to hit that like button, share the video, leave a comment and suggestion for future videos, check out this playlist and the membership. But most important of all, remember, if you see that all the rebels are using your address, it might be time to move. And the force will be with you. Always.